do you believe that science can help to save lives and improve society and change the world for the better? Of course it bloody can, otherwise why are we doing it? The fact then that we are literally selling off our culture to commercial publishers is actively preventing that. You know, we're selling off our history, our culture, our knowledge, our, our just everything about who we are as humans to commercial entities to privatize and sell it off to the highest bidder rather than letting it be used to save the world. Open science. For some people, it is just science done correctly. And for other people, it is the revolutionary change in the whole academic culture. These different perspectives are highly dependent on your views on the role of science in society, who your advisors were, which fields you were in, which career stages you reached, and where you lived and worked. In this episode, we talk about open science, especially open access, and what values and goals are behind it, why they're really necessary, and how you can join the movement. As always, you will find the summary of this episode on our website, www.scienceforprogress.eu. And if you are a patron, you can listen to the whole conversation on Patreon, www.patreon.com slash progress In case you missed it, I began releasing these extended episodes with a seven-month delay. To date, extended episodes 9 to 16 are available to the public. You can find the direct links in the respective show notes on our website. Thanks to those who already support us with a monthly pledge of their choosing. And for those who have been waiting for this episode since last week, I'm very sorry. There were other things that came up unexpectedly that I had to prioritize. I think that this episode was worth the wait anyways. I am your host, Dennis Eckmeyer, and you're listening to episode 31 of the Science for Societal Progress podcast. My name is John Tennant. By training, I'm a paleontologist. I did my PhD at Imperial College London and finished that a couple of years ago. Now I work on a range of things to do with open science and scholarly communication and peer review, while still sort of dabbling in dinosaurs every now and then, because why not? <laughs> And of course, the first question that we all have, what exactly is open science? I'm just about to release a video of a talk I gave a couple of weeks ago in Brussels where I, the talk was, I have no idea what open science is. And I think it means a lot of very different things to a lot of very different people. So if you speak to some people and you say, you know, what do you think about open science? And they're like, well, what is open science? And they say, oh, you know, it's about releasing you know the research and making it publicly accessible uh you know the data and the code and the software environment and the research articles themselves and then someone might say well hold it isn't that just normal science or just you know releasing this the actual research itself isn't that just what research or science is supposed to be and yeah that's this whole thing where open science could just be perceived as communicating science more effectively to the public um For other people, open science is sort of like a fundamental uh, research culture shift about creating like a healthier, less toxic research environment where we're not being forced to publish in high impact journals and all of this nonsense, which is really uh, creating a lot of strife within sort of the modern academy. Um, for a lot of people, again, you know, who might come at this from a sort of open source perspective will say that open science is fundamentally about challenging proprietary systems and redeveloping a way in which we can do research in a much more sort of web native or computational environment. So open science means a lot of different things, a lot of different people. For, for me, it's more about sort of fundamental principles because I've been reading a lot about open source and the history behind the free software movement recently. And one of the reasons why that took off so well is because encoded into notions of the sort of uh, culture that it was creating around free software was the foundational principle around freedoms. They had four fundamental freedoms to define the movement which they created. And now, you know, you can't go anywhere without running into open source software, right? It's, it's literally everywhere. Like, you know, even Google, Facebook, you know, their foundations are built on open source software. Um, but we haven't done that for science yet, or at least not for open science. We haven't defined what the sort of fundamental shared values and bonds that unite sort of all research and all scholarship. But what are the developments that we can already look forward to? Open science has become like the sort of mainstream thing where it means, like I mentioned before, like a lot of very different things, a lot of different people. Whatever it is, it's definitely sort of here to stay. And some of the sort of practical things, which is really about like on a very pragmatic basis, are things like combating 
issues to do with reproducibility. So there's this thing called like the reproducibility crisis, where a lot of sort of fundamental or analytical empirical research in fields like psychology, medicine cannot be reproduced, like the results or whatever cannot be um, obtained again by sort of re repeating the uh, research under different conditions or the same conditions. And this isn't necessarily a problem with like the research itself. Like it's a problem with the fact that a PDF does not represent research very well. And if you're trying to re recreate a PDF and all you have is a PDF, no, sorry, if you're trying to recreate like a piece of research and all you have is a PDF, that's going to be bloody difficult. So practically in some senses, open science is a way to unlock the uh, sort of the actual research environment itself. So things like sharing the raw or the treated data along with, you know, the metadata and as well as that, you know, making sure that the code or the scripts which were used to execute um, the an uh, analysis behind that data can be made openly available too. And like ideally, you can go in there, you can expect the data, inspect the data, inspect the code and sort of click a button and make any modifications you need to and see if you get that again. If you believe that reproducibility should be a cornerstone for just good science, then these sort of open scientific practices should be inherent to how we perform science. And it's incredibly easy to do. Sharing code has never been easier. People have been doing it for 30 years. Sharing research articles openly was literally why the web was invented. You know, it was difficult 50 years ago, but now it's not so much. So I must say, I find it really difficult to find coherent information about open science activities. And that's basically because there are a lot of small organizations and groups and individuals working on this. And as John just explained, there are very different opinions and different ideas behind open science. Depending on what you mean by open science, some people will say it goes all the way back to like the lab bench and you have to make like the protocols open. You have to publish your methodologies or whatever before you even, so this whole idea of pre-registration, right? It's like where you publish your methods and your protocols um, before you've even gathered data so that, you know, actually the outcomes don't really matter. It doesn't matter what data you collect um, or what the results are. Speaking of correcting other people's work, that actually has caused quite some stir up in the scientific community. A lot of people don't like it if data and methods are openly available and free for everybody to critique. For example, groups that dedicated themselves to developing methods that check statistics in papers, etc., have received quite some pushback. And this seems to be a defense mechanism based on the assumption that if your research has any kind of flaw, that means you're being attacked as a scientist and as a person. In other words, if you critique the methods of the researcher, they often respond as if you called them a fraud. When did it become unacceptable for a scientist to make mistakes? We have this elitist sort of image, you know, this ivory tower viewpoint that everything we produce is completely polished gold and ends up in these peer reviewed glorious manuscripts that are like, you know, an epiphany and the truth. And, you know, they speak truth to everyone and everyone must listen to the almighty scientist. And it's like, actually, you know, what you produce was just, you know, an anecdote in a PDF and the research itself, you made a lot of mistakes and we should be okay communicating that. This has to do, I think, with the basic idea that science in itself is objective and self-correcting. However, a lot of people seem to forget that this is not meant to mean that every single study and scientist is in itself perfectly objective, self-correcting, and that peer review articles are the final truth. The self-correcting mechanism of science actually works over a long time span, with many researchers working on similar topics basing their hypotheses on top of each other's findings. And if there is a flaw somewhere, then all hypotheses based on that flawed assumption will fail at some point. And that's the point where scientists need to go back and reevaluate their assumptions. In other words, the findings they are basing their own research approach on. And depending on what we're talking about, hypotheses can stand for centuries before they are completely overturned or at least adjusted when new information comes in. So the fundamental assumption underlying the scientific principle of objectivity and the mechanisms of self-correction are not properties of the single scientist. It's that science is never finished, but there is always some research done or applications developed based on previous findings. Only if people stop doing that, it becomes really difficult. Yeah, you're totally right. I mean, like, this is the thing, like, how do you 
define sort of research quality or authority, I guess, in some ways. And, you know, time is sometimes the only thing that we need. You know, the reason why evolution or whatever is still still around or whatever is because it's been like that for what, a century and a half now, and no one's managed to adequately disprove it. A year after I published my thesis, I basically disproved the core element to it <laughs> by just doing different research. It was like, oh, there we go. That's fine. Yeah, that was that was interesting. <laughs> So you disproved the core element of evolution? Oh, no, no, just of my own thesis, which I, I guess was, it was like, um, some of it was like macro evolutionary theory, I guess, you know, what drives evolution, extinction, diversity changes. And then I, yeah, was a year after I decided to just look at the data again in a different way. I was like, ah, if I, you know, look at this additional dimension to the data, then it turns out this is a really unstable sort of hypothesis. Um, whoops. But but I was okay with that. It was like fantastic. I was really happy about it. It was like great. You yeah, know? you can correct it and publish that. Yeah. But like the whole idea of science being self-correcting. I mean, it only really works if people are out there actually doing the correction, right? You know, so actually checking. You know, if we assume that science is automatically self-correcting, it removes the incentive to actually go out there and make sure that we're actively correcting the record. One of the most important open science aspects for researchers in science clearly is open access, which is about accessibility of research papers to the public and other scientists. So the scholarly journal has been around for what, 350 years, give or take. And um, whenever research was published in one of these journals or articles, it always had this strange duality of at the same time being public, but not publicly available, right? Because you'd have to pay, you know, back in the old days, you pay a couple of pennies for you know, accessing a journal. In the post Second World War era, there were hundreds, well, tens of thousands of these journals now, and research really sort of took off and became a global phenomenon. It became really collaborative. There are lots of different sort of subdisciplines started specializing, which grew to more and more journals being operated, often by learned societies or small communities. And then um, capitalism sort of took over, and a lot of commercial entities realized that, wait, there's, there are these researchers who are managing these journals for free doing all the peer reviewing for free and giving away their content for free. And no one's making a dime off that really. And they started buying up the journals and they essentially began privatizing knowledge very gradually over the next sort of few decades. And this was mostly in the Western world again, because that's where a lot of sort of core research was being done in uh, academies at the time. Open access came about as a term back in 2001. And it was sort of like the counterculture to this. It was like, right, We've started privatizing a lot of our knowledge. Most of it's publicly inaccessible, even if it was publicly funded. Open access, we're going to say it's this fundamental principle where uh, if research has been publicly funded, it should be freely available for uh, reading and reuse by anyone and everyone. You know, it had earlier roots back with the development of the web. So I sort of hinted earlier, you know, the whole reason why the World Wide Web was developed was by researchers at CERN to share scientific knowledge and data with each other instantaneously and freely. And yet the only thing that we have failed yet to achieve with the web is to share our scientific knowledge freely and instantaneously. So yeah, that's sort of where open access happened. In Latin America and Africa, they did it in a very sort of different way. They uh, have sort of like a more government-sponsored initiatives behind these sorts of things. Like, for example, the Scientific Electronic Library Online uh, in Latin America is probably one of the best initiatives in the world for getting research out to the people who need to use it. In the Western world, we have been almost completely corrupted and co-opted by commercial publishers. Open access, I guess, and the advent of the web was supposed to be highly disruptive to them. And yet they found a way to essentially mimic the analog way in which they were working and just bring it into the digital world. And, you know, at the moment, open access is still sort of like an ideology in a way. Uh, we've absolutely completely failed to realize open access in, I guess, any sort of meaningful way, I think, after what? 20 something years of campaigning, we've managed to liberate about 27% of all public research to be publicly accessible via open access. And I don't want to wait another 70 years while people are dying from not having information. Whoa, people are dying because of lack of access to scientific knowledge? Do you believe that science can help to save lives and improve society and change the world for the, be for the better? It's like the answer is always, of course it bloody can, otherwise why are we doing it? And it's like, okay, the fact then that we are literally selling off our culture to commercial publishers like Wiley and Springer Nature and Taylor and Francis and the big E is actively preventing that. You know, we're selling off 
our history, our culture, our knowledge, our, our just everything about who we are as humans to commercial entities to privatize and sell it off to the highest bidder rather than letting it be used to save the world. It makes me a little bit depressed sometimes. So how could universal open access publishing look like? Thankfully, there are already great systems in place elsewhere in the world. One example that I hear mentioned a lot of times is the publishing system in Latin America. As far as I understand it, so in 1997, a very intelligent, passionate man called Abel Packer decided that people in Latin America needed access to research because the knowledge they were producing was a societal good. So he set up this thing called Cielo, the Scientific Electronic Library Online. And as far as I'm aware, what it is, is it's sort of like an infrastructure for Latin American journals to be completely open access while at the same time not charging authors to publish there because there's a lot of government sponsorship coming in. And I think they have something like two and a half to three thousand journals. You can fact check me that on Wikipedia after um, and edit that out if needed. Um, and they're all open access. They publish exactly the same um, sort of technological quality that we have from the big Western publishing houses. They publish all their work in English, Portuguese, and Spanish, and with like full text XML and all of these sorts of things. It's research which is designed by researchers to make a public impact and is able to do so. And until recently as well, they did it without sort of a Western commercial influence. Um, and it's bloody fantastic. Um, and I think it's, it's definitely a model of the way in which things should be done. In Europe, the Coalition S released the infamous Plan S. Is that going to solve the accessibility problem in Europe? So Plan S was this magical initiative, right? Uh, launched last year to make all publicly funded research in you know, the coalition funding bodies to be open access. And I tweeted Robert Jan Smits um, saying, great, it's so nice to see that we're finally catching up to Latin America and what they were doing 25 years ago. Um, and it's sort of true. It's like, why, why is it taking so long for you know, Western researchers in North America and uh, Western Europe to do what is normative in other cultures? And then why are we pretending that we are the ones leading the way? I actually don't remember ever coming across a paper from that publishing system. This is the thing. So this morning I read a beautiful thing. So do you know how if you read a journal by Elsevier or Wiley or whatever, these are global and international journals, right? Mm -hmm. But if you want to read one which is done by a publisher in Latin America, it's a local or a regional journal hmm. for basically no reason other than colonialism, again, and, uh, you know, trying to assert some sort of dominance over, over the world, I guess, in a way. Um, it's really interesting that you mentioned the discoverability of these platforms. So uh, if you look at two of the most prominent um, scholarly indexing sort of platforms or engines, so Web of Science and Scopus. Web of Science owned by uh, Claravit, who are responsible for the impact factor, and Scopus owned by Elsevier, who are responsible for everything else wrong with this world. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, so both of these are Western commercial entities, and they are actively discriminating on a daily basis against research from countries which are not essentially white and Western and wealthy and elite. And we have a paper in press at the moment which details some of the sort of um, numbers behind this. So if you look at, for example, just um, journals that are published, again, in Latin America, all across Africa, in Asia, um, and you know uh, Japan, Indonesia, all of these sort of countries, they all publish like thousands of local journals. Really, you know, good research for good reasons, good, by, good, by good people. And Web of Science and Scopus, they say, no, it's not real because it's not in English, because it doesn't meet our standards for how we perceive high quality publishing to be. And, you know, basically you have this uh, Western hegemony still sort of dictating the global rules of what is acceptable to enter the uh, widely accessed scholarly record. And it's a hideously racist system. Overall, John finds that the corporate interests that have taken over the scholarly publishing activities in the West are at the root of many problems in Western academia. You know, these people have been uh, exploiting the public 
and helping contributing to the downfall of society for enough time now. When you see things like, what's it, the bloody uh, CEO of Relics, the company that owns Elsevier, gets, what, 15 million euros a year, which is the same as, like, two or three national subscription contracts to Elsevier. And it's like, how is one man worth that much? And it's like, he's not. And it contributes again to this just this whole sort of Western capitalistic sort of uh, control that is dominating global research cultures at the moment. And at some point, we're going need to need to say enough is enough. In the United States, research funded by federal agencies needs to be made publicly available, even by journals that are usually behind paywalls. Now, Coalition S is trying to achieve something similar in Europe. However, the discussion about Plan S appears to be very difficult. Oh, yeah, right. Oh, my goodness, it is complicated. So the thing in the US is um, specific only to research, which is funded by the National Institute of Health and the National Science Foundation. Um, I think I'm not sure about the second one, actually. You need to fact check me on that one again. But like the NIH, they put into place their open access policy, I think back in like 2007. And this was back when the commercial publishers were terrified of open access. And they equated open access with government censorship and low quality research and all of this stuff. Um, go and look, you know, the American Chemical Society, Elsevier, all of these people equated open access with government censorship. It's out there, it's public information. Um, they are, you know, literally enemies to science. Uh, in Europe, plan us. Oh, it's complicated. So again, back almost like a decade ago now, you know, the European Commission said that uh, research that is funded by European, uh, by the European Research Councils and other funding bodies must be made open access, yada, yada, yada. Um, and then Horizon 2020 came about. And the mandate there was that all publicly funded research within Europe must be open access by 2020. We want 100% open access by 2020. That was never going to happen because um, what they were trying to do essentially was try and make open access work within a hideously inefficient and expensive system where there was so much money being wasted on both subscriptions and paying for open access at the same time that it meant growth was incredibly slow. So Plan S was sort of like the kick in the ass to everyone in Europe to begin with to say, right, this is unacceptable. Like, again, people are dying. We're not using research well. We're wasting money. Let's get this done. Let's get it done fast, like as we were supposed to do. And yeah, it caused all sorts of chaos because researchers don't like being told what to do. Publishers were enjoying having a lot of control over uh, sort of the politics and the policy environment, as well as the sort of research environment. And uh, senior researchers all of a sudden didn't like being told that some of the places where they were going to be published would be unacceptable in the future if they wanted to be funded. And it caused a gigantic mess. And it's been very interesting to watch. John finds the complexity of the topic, which involves so many different viewpoints, to be overwhelmingly difficult to condense into one single narrative about the discussion around Plan S. I, I was at a conference in Taiwan And I was uh, supposed to be like an open access specialist at this conference. And someone asked me, it's like, can you tell me your thoughts on Plan S? And I said, no, it's like, I'm not going to do this. And then she was like, she said, no, you're the open access expert. You have to tell us your thoughts on Plan S. And 15 minutes later, everyone was really <laughs> angry <laughs> because <laughs> it was just such a difficult sort of thing to convey. You know, it's like the rules of the game are changing and it impacts everybody. And all of a sudden, now that people have realized that the rules of the game are going to be changing and it's going to affect them. They're like, holy crap, oh, we should probably take an interest in this. And we're seeing the pushback happen right now. We're seeing senior researchers abusing those who stand up for open access. We're seeing commercial publishers essentially just sharing propaganda and fake news online. You know, particularly Springer Nature are particularly guilty of this. They just are absolutely lying through their teeth in almost every sort of public statement that they make. Spring and Nature are the biggest open access publisher. To be honest, it's sort of half true. It's half true because they acquired two of the other biggest open access publishers. But if you apply the same measure to how they measure their success in the open access world, they're also still the second largest barrier-based publisher in the world as well. Essentially, people are just using silly, naive marketing strategies to make themselves look good within an open space because whatever open science is, it's here to stay. And if the industry wants to sort of maintain a position within this, they have to look like advocates of open science. 
if you go to, um, for example, what's it, lobbyfacts.eu right now and look at what it says for Elsevier, it'll say something like Elsevier lobbies on behalf of the medical, scientific and research communities for the advancement of science and open science. <laughs> I'm pretty sure you're not. <laughs> How can you be lobbying for open science if there is no coherent body that represents open science and no coherence in what people define as open science? I just want to define what open science is authoritatively. And this is also a sort of problem in itself because no one really knows what open science is. When Elsevier and Springer say, actually, you know, we do do open science. And then you're like, well, no, you're not. And they can say, oh, sure we do. We have an open access journal. We have a data sharing policy. And um, yeah, good. We do open science. And then you're like, well, no, you don't because you don't adhere to the same principles uh, that we adhere to as, you know, the open science community. And they can simply say, Open science isn't about the principles, it's about open access and open data and yada, yada, yada. I think at the moment, the best thing that we can all do, because it is so complicated, is just be patient and see what happens and be mindful of what the potential impacts could be, what the facts are, what, what are the actual pieces of evidence that led to the formation of the policy? How are they going to impact different cultures um, and different communities? Sorry. And just wait. For John, open science is about much more than simply making science and research openly available to everybody. You know, Latin America did do a response to Plan S, the, uh, this new sort of initiative called Amelica. I can't remember what it stands for, but they basically did the same thing. They were like, oh, yeah, you know, we have principles about open access, too. And they're sort of, in my view, much, much, much stronger than those put forward by Plan S or Coalition S. The sort of fundamental values behind the people and the principles in the open science community are things like equity, freedom, fairness, justice, and all of these things, because really, that is the sort of bigger fight that we're fighting. How difficult is it to build a movement about open science that would follow these principles and values and ensure that they are incorporated in the academic publishing culture in Western academia? There's a lot of, there's a lot of people out there who are really, really angry with how things work in the modern academy. The problem is a lot of them are also overworked and a lot of them are also really tired. And, you know, we've, I, I feel like as a sort of research culture in Europe, we've lost our sort of um, activist spark quite a bit. We don't even have a defined name yet or like a definition of what we're doing. We don't have goals. We don't have a foundation. We don't have shared values. The best thing which we need to be doing as a sort of research community at the moment is defining what we stand for what we want to achieve, where we come from, why we're doing all of this, what are the things that we all share together, and how can we support each other more as a community based on all of these things to really make active, sustained change for the better. And this is why we're building the Open Science MOOC. This is exactly what we're building around this, like, you know, strong values, strong principles, strong training, a frippin' brilliant community like oh my goodness the people who are part of the space are the best people i've ever came across in my entire life um it's incredible and i think we're going to need all of that if we're actually going to really start to make any sort of meaningful change before it's too late the so-called open science mooc is a project that john and quite a few other people in the community are working on together what are they trying to do we're trying to work on a number of different levels so that this political ideology that's now coming through um people actually sort of understand it from a bottom-up route too so it's not like we're working in parallel but we're, we are definitely pulling more in the same direction so we call the c in mooc community so we're the massive open online community but the weird thing is we're also very much offline so you know the steering committee who who helped me with the mooc they're all my close friends in real life um that's sort of like the same sort of thing within the open science community is like we're not just a bunch of people working together to improve science we're like friends and we're colleagues and we're lovers in many respects as well and it's just brilliant so yeah like there are many ways people can join the community though like one of the most useful things people can do is like we have an open slack channel you'll find the slack channel and other resources of the open science mooc linked in the show notes The other main resource of the Open Science MOOC is the actual online course. Yeah, we have two modules live at the moment out of 10. The first is um, to learn about the principles behind open science. And then the second one 
is to integrate a sort of open source workflow into your research life by learning how to use things like Git and GitHub and uh, Zenodo and all of this stuff. The whole idea is that it teaches people knowledge and new skills, new practical skills as part of a sort of peer to peer learning environment. And you get to meet really cool people as part of it and be part of a fun and vibrant community. And, you know, there's no costs. There's no nothing. Everything is as open as we can possibly make it. There's very low barriers to entry. But like a lot of the stuff which we try and teach uh, or, or share even is um, our transferable skills and transferable knowledge that people can take and use in whatever walk of life which they choose. You know, two of the modules we'll, we'll be developing in the future as well will be around um, citizen science and public engagement with science. Some of it is definitely going to be like a really big social component to what we do in the future. And obviously, I don't just want scientists you know, building this stuff and teaching this stuff. You know, it's supposed to be, you know, it wouldn't be very a very open project if it was confined just to scientists. So it's supposed to be open for all. We just have to make sure that we're actually making sure that we're behaving that right. way as well, I guess. If we combine both Iliadami and Slack, we're at more than a thousand people all working together at the moment just to make a better world. And it's pretty goddamn cool. So, <laughs> like every day is completely unexpected. Like what's it over the weekend, for example, I had a dozen librarians from Africa all emailing me saying, how can they integrate the MOOC into like their library and e-learning oh, structures? Wow. And I was like, holy bloody hell, like <laughs> how did that come about? <laughs> it was just amazing. Like, you know, every, every sort of day is unexpected, but like there's this huge wave in the open science world at the moment. And we're sort of riding the crest of it and just mm -hmm. seeing where it goes. Yeah. I feel very positive about a number of things in this space right now. So like, for example, just yesterday, me and a group of friends, we met here at a pub in Berlin and we decided that we were going to found what we're going to call probably the open science Academy to start formalizing community engagement around open science. So we had the founders meeting yesterday. This shit is happening. It's going down. Um, and really begin to bring people together in the sort of very fragmented, disorienting landscape and provide a people-based infrastructure for people to uh, move with together. And I think, you know, just little things like that, the people are so inspiring. You know, I'm living with someone right now um, and her mission in life at the moment is to bridge um, the north-south divide in global research, you know, particularly in Africa. And it's just like, what a bloody brilliant thing to be doing in life. It's like, what a fantastic thing to dedicate your time to. You know, in Berlin, you know, all of my close friends and colleagues here are all doing similarly ambitious things. And it's really inspiring. It's really empowering. And it really makes me feel like we've got the best people in this space. And they are passionate. They are dedicated. Um, they are beautiful in many different ways. And it makes me just feel like, you know, it's going to be a difficult sort of scrap over the next few years or whatever but I think we will all end up working together to build something better for science and for the world. So on this very optimistic note, I hope that your interest in the open science community has awoken. And even if you don't want to be part of it, you should definitely check out their work and read all about it. You will find the summary of this episode and links to John's open science activities and further readings in the show notes, alongside a link to the complete conversation I had with John on Patreon. We actually talked about a lot of more things than I could put into this episode. And while you're there, please think about supporting us so this openly accessible podcast can continue and improve. If you have questions, critique or suggestions, please get in contact by email info at scienceforprogress.eu or on social media at sci for progress for Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. Please subscribe and rate this podcast on your podcast app and maybe write a review. I thank you very much for listening. Have a good day. Bye bye.